Hello and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca King-Reed. This week we're in Santa Cruz, just about to hop aboard the Iowa Pacific for a ride on the newly reopened Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. This is the most recent train to rumble through the Central Coast, but it's not the first. We'll get a lesson in railroad history from Sandy Lydon. We'll also meet a different kind of engineer, one whose battery-powered motorcycle has set a new world record and a Santa Cruz woman who is the only U.S. designer to be invited to UK Fashion Week. Finally, a local doctor saving lives around the world with a solar power plant that fits into a suitcase. We've got some great stories to share, and it all starts now. This is us. Welcome back. Joining me now is noted local historian Sandy Lydon. Thank Sandy, thanks for joining us today. Oh, Becca, this is going to be fun. It is going to be fun. We're on a train. It's so exciting. Now, trains didn't get to Santa Cruz until about 1870, and when they came, everything changed. Tell us what the differences were after the train. Well, the county is trapped by the Santa Cruz Mountains on one side and the ocean on the other, and, the, and those mountains are filled with potential products. Lumber, leather, and lime. Those are the three L's of, <laughs> of Santa Cruz County. So they had all the stuff, but they couldn't get it out. You could ship it out by sea, but the bay is not the best. It's rough and it's, you know, it's not predictable. So delivery unreliable. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and the rest of the country was getting railroads. And of course, the Transcontinental was finished in 69, 1869. So Santa Cruz looked longingly at the railroads that were out there, hoping that they would get one that would connect with somewhere. In the early 1870s, Southern Pacific brought a train down through Gilroy and down and around the corner, across the Pajaro River, got to Pajaro on the other side of the river, looked over at Watsonville and said, bye, and took off to Salinas. Uh -huh. So now you've got a railroad that's close, but still no connection. And the Southern Pacific Railroad wasn't willing to spend the money and take the effort to build the railroad through here because it's extremely rough. This, this terrace is cut with arroyos and rivers and it's just a mess. So the local people raise some money and eventually they will build their own railroad. And so um, we have a number of industries that will take off, including lumber, much more than it had, um, and particularly the fishing industry because the fishing industry was constrained by the half-life of, of a dead fish. Um, right, so you had to get it out of here. You had to get it out of here. Quickly. And the train was the fastest the way. The train was the fastest way. Okay. Well, we'll come back with more information in just a minute about the train. Oh, I look forward to it. We'll be back in a minute with more from the Iowa Pacific. But first, John Gregg has the story of a man who's invented a green motorcycle that has broken the land speed record at the Bonneville Salt Flats. some of us, motorcycles are the coolest machines around. Well, Richard Hatfield has just made them cooler and greener. There was a time when people thought of electric motorcycles as glorified golf carts on two wheels. Well, those days are long gone, and to prove the point, engineer Richard Hatfield has designed an electric-powered bike using lithium batteries that shattered the land speed record at the Bonneville Salt Flats, hitting a speed of 218 miles per hour. Sort of sounds like your vacuum cleaner and runs like your Prius on steroids. As if your Prius only had two tires and hit 218 flat out. Usually people are very surprised. Uh, you know, the, there's no shifting. You twist the throttle and go. And these motors are capable of two, two and a half times the torque of a thousand cc gas bike. So the acceleration off of a corner is, is really, really impressive. Instead of gasoline, by using lithium battery power, the savings is jaw-dropping. So at a typical rate in California of 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it's 18 cents worth of electricity. So if you project that out and, uh, you know, to, uh, to a fuel economy equivalent, which uh, most engineers say that a gallon of gas is 32 to 36 kilowatt hours per gallon, uh, we were getting the equivalent of almost 60 miles per gallon at 218 miles an hour. Not all of us need to get around at over 200 miles an hour. Well, maybe some of us do. 
So what did the numbers look like if you're driving a rather pedestrian 65 miles an hour? At that range, now we're up over 100 miles in range on a 12 kilowatt hour battery pack. So we're, we're pushing up to close to 300 miles per gallon equivalent. Again, on a bike that's capable of going over 200 miles an hour. The San Carlos bike builder didn't start out to set world records. But at heart, he's always been a gearhead. My first career was in software. I was involved in developing a software package to man manage assets for uh, uh, financial companies. And that brought me into my second career, which is I, I started and ran a company that did revolving lines of credit for emerging companies. And uh, now my third career is uh, electric motorcycles. Hatfield grew up in Iowa, and he attended Grinnell College before migrating west to UCLA. So I, I grew up in the Midwest, and uh, every summer I would do agricultural jobs, baling hay and working, uh, uh, detasseling corn, whatever we could do to save money and, and buy a new or better bike each year. So uh, my first uh, two bikes were Ducatis, a Ducati 200 Scramler and a, and a 250 Mark IV. After that was a, a Norton 810 Dunstall and a 750 Kawasaki H2. So I'm going to take that to 18 volts. As a businessman, Hatfield may have developed revolving lines of credit for guys in suits and ties, but he was always thinking about engines and engineering. One of the big challenges on an electric motorcycle is getting the weight down to the same weight as a gas bike and packaging a lot of components in the area of a motorcycle. So our, our solution has been to make most of the components serve multiple functions. The motor is also the main stressed element of the frame. The swing arm connects to the center of the motor. The battery pack has a stress skin which carries the loads from the front fork into the motor. The secret sauce in these machines is the chef. And Hatfield has come up with his own design for the motors. This is one of our motor cases. The shock absorber mounts from the top. The swing arm mounts off of the side on bearings. The oil sump in the bottom uh, is connected to the oil air heat exchanger. And the oil cooling is really one of the key components in having high power settings for high periods of time. It's as simple as plugging it in, charging it up, and taking off. There are actually two cells in parallel, and there are 90 groups of those two cells in the bike. So off the charger, you're cranking at around 400 volts. The batteries have an incredible amount of performance, and uh, all the other uh, links in the chain also can support this. So actually, the batteries at this point will make two to three times the power that we're currently making with the bike. So we can see in the next year that it's possible to build these bikes with uh, 400 horsepower. Eventually, all this work will probably end up in scooters that go 50 miles an hour, or 50 miles, and you charge it on 50 cents worth of electricity. But right now, zero carbons and 200 mile per hour technology has made going green loads of fun. I'm so engaged with this and I'm so passionate about it. You know, it's really waking up in the morning and what can we do to, to move the ball forward. But it's one of the things that I tell my children is that the, the biggest limitations that we face are the ones that we put on ourselves. Usually there's so much more that's possible than what we allow ourselves to do. You know, Richard, we've been talking about motorcycles all day long. Yeah, let's ride. Welcome back. Sandy Leiden and I are riding the rails through Santa Cruz County, and this is just such a treat, especially to take a railroad uh, car ride along the coast. And we really owe a big debt of gratitude to the people who built the railroads. Tell us who those people were. Well, the railroads in the state, and particularly here, um, were built by Chinese laborers, many of whom had worked on the transcontinental, on the big one, going across the Sierra, and then in 69, when that was finished, worked as, as for contractors at, at various well, other railroad railroads. projects. And it was kind of harrowing work, wasn't it? Very difficult. There's a, there's a phrase. Um, it's called Chinaman's Chance. Um, oh, you, don't Chinaman's chance and... you don't have a Chinaman's Chance? You don't have a Chinaman's Chance. That's not much of a chance. And it comes from railroads. 
It comes from the fact that they would um, get, get blown up, run over, um, it, it, very, very difficult work. But they were very good at it, and no one else would do it. It was, you know, very difficult to get somebody else to take those kinds of risks. Now, one of the most difficult places to build the railroad was in the mountains, and that's where one of these entrepreneurial railroads started. It was part plume, part railroad. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, that's the Santa Cruz and Felton, and that started out with a flume. They used the water to transport the sawn lumber. So planks, not, the planks, not, not the planks. logs. One plank at a time uh, down a ditch made out of redwood. Um, and it went 14 miles ultimately from um, up near Boulder Creek down to Felton. Now in order to do that, it must have taken quite a circuitous route. Yes, it did. It jumped back and forth across the river a number of times. Yeah, I think it's a very appropriate technology way of moving things because once they got done with it, they could dismantle it and they built houses out of the out of the lumber. Now before they did that, there was a little surfing going on up there in the flume. Yeah, the kids the, apparently saw the immediate <laughs> recreational possibilities <laughs> and and they would ride the planks when the <laughs> flume walker wasn't wasn't around. They'd get on the plank and ride them and we've often said that probably surfing, if you can imagine one of these kids like 8 years old standing up on a redwood plank going down the ditch would have been something to see. So. <laughs> on a good day, 30,000 board feet of lumber would travel down that flume to Felton. When we come back, we'll talk about how it moved from Felton all the way down onto the wharf by train. But first, we're going to talk to a local designer whose clothing is making a big hit on the international fashion scene. This is the glamorous life of a fashion designer jetting around the world, watching your latest collection hit the runway. And if the glamorous life had a reality show, this is where it would be filmed. Designer Jill Alexander works out of a 900 square foot loft in Santa Cruz. It's a sewing corner, cutting room, draping area, retail store, and design center. The glamorous life never looked so cozy. It's a job, and it's a job that I really, really love. But um, all of the all of the glamour and and runway and magazine things that you see, it's a blip. Alexander designs plus size fashions. Only one of ten independent designers invited to show her work at New York's Full Figure Fashion Week. She's been invited back twice. And the only U.S. designer invited to Europe's plus-size couture show. Both coups for any designer, but for someone in this business just three years, an unheard of feat. In 2010, Alexander showed her designs at just one show, and her business took off. I didn't even have that many pieces, and I brought them down there, and we sold out of everything. It was more of a shove, I think, <laughs> than a launch. <laughs> Relatively new to runway shows, Alexander still remembers how she felt the first time she saw her clothes strut down a catwalk. I felt like I was burying my soul. You give birth to this collection and here it is, you know, for people to digest, to love or to hate. You know, you just never know how, how people are going to react. And so far, nothing but praise. Alexander's designs have been featured in several fashion publications, most recently, People Magazine style section. Yet this is not the picture of an overnight success. Both Alexander's parents worked in retail. As a teen, she always pitched in. That's her in pajamas helping with a Christmas display. From an early age, Alexander learned the importance of a collection. When we would go school shopping, we were putting together our wardrobe. It wasn't this like, oh, I need a new pair of jeans. Oh, I like that top. It was really thinking from a very early age how all those pieces were going to work together. Alexander took her early training to Ann Taylor and other retailers before taking time off to start a family. It was when she started sewing costumes for her youngest daughter's theater group, a seed of an idea was planted. You have a room full of all of these little kids and they're running around like crazy maniacs, screaming, dancing, and then all of a sudden you dress this little boy like a king, you put a crown on his head and, and his cloak on and all of a sudden he's a king. And I really think that that is the basis of everything I do is 
is I really believe that fashion is transformational. It, it turns you into someone else or maybe who you even really are. Jill Alexander designs high-end fashions for the nation's curvy women, sizes 12 and up, a market she says has been long ignored. I'd love for women to be able to go in and visit a place where everything fits them and salespeople are nice to them. <laughs> And the lighting's really good, and the mirrors are friendly, and they can go back again and again and just build on their wardrobe. How's that feel across the front? Good. Becky Edwards knows all too well how hard it is for curvy women to build a wardrobe. She's one of Alexander's favorite models and a big fan of the designer's clothes. They're colorful, they're fun, and they're going to fit me, and they're going to be flattering. And that's hard to find. Designs that are bold, bright, and daring. Traditionally, no-nos in the plus-size fashion world, but for Alexander, nothing is off-limits, as she hopes to revamp how curvy women see themselves. When they put something on that I've created, I really want them to feel like their best selves, like these figure flaws are non-existent. I really hope that they feel beautiful. From sewing together a king's costume to her designs changing the look of full-figure fashion, Jill Alexander's overnight success story doesn't have a final chapter yet. I'm not at the point yet where I'm willing to say I'm an overnight success. You know, I'm not even really willing to use the word success yet because I still have so much more I want to do. Sandy and I are back and we're going to have the end to the story. So now the, the lumber travels by Flume to Felton and what happens next? Well, it's offloaded from the flume, put in a big pile, then they have to move it onto the train to the lumber cars. It's a narrow gauge railroad, 36 inches between the rails. The train we're on is four foot eight and a half inches between the rails, very different. So it, it could make little sharp corners. So when they built it in the canyon, it just weaves around. It actually went around trees if they were in the way. And it just goes down, down, down. And eventually it comes down to the flat. And then they built a wharf. And the train went right out onto the wharf so they could offload onto ships. And the ship oh, quite sit. a ways into the bay. That's right. It's 1,200 feet. And they ship lumber from here all over the Pacific. Tahiti, Hawaii, um, the, the, the tropics. The redwood is very good for the tropics. So. Um, most of the lumber that came out of these mountains didn't go to San Francisco. It went out of here south and west. Uh -huh. um, there was a change in the route. They were coming straight down Pacific and eventually they, we, they went through Mission Well, Hill. they wouldn't let them drive the locomotive down Pacific Avenue because that was Main Street. So they had to actually hook on a horse and take the, the lumber cars down to the wharf by horse. So they decided they were going to go through Mission Hill. Um, and so they had to tunnel. And Chinese were the tunnel guys. But the anti-Chinese movement was very strong in Santa Cruz. And they wouldn't let the Chinese work inside town. So they hired a group of Cornish miners who then dug, dug the tunnel. Like 900 feet. 900 feet. It's still there. And it's the only tunnel in these mountains that wasn't built by Chinese. And it was built that way because the anti-Chinese movement was so strong here. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your great railroad stories. We're very excited to have had you on the show. And and I hope you can come back again. Hey, we got to ride the train. Yeah, I know. It's so true. Very cool. We'll be back in a minute. But first, we're going to meet a local public health doctor whose innovation is saving lives all over the world on a daily basis. Before I went to Africa, I think I had assumed that women were dying of very rare diseases, things I'd never seen as an obstetrician. I was absolutely stunned and appalled by what I saw. During the nighttime, very often the midwives were conducting births by candlelight, by kerosene lantern. A hospital without electricity was something Laura Stachel never imagined. For 14 years, she had been a well-respected OBGYN in Berkeley until a back injury sidelined her career. The doctor had been so good at her job, she could deliver a baby by cesarean in just under two minutes. But without power, none of that mattered. Any type of delivery is nearly impossible. One, and the lights just went out. So much of what we do requires electricity. The monitors, the lights, the machinery for helping with deliveries. It never occurred to me that in other parts of the world that the things that we assume to be completely fundamental to medical care would be absent. That revelation came to Laura after her first visit to Africa in 2008. 
While studying for a PhD in public health at UC Berkeley, she was asked to observe the conditions at a Nigerian hospital. It was to find out why women there were 70 times more likely to die in childbirth than women in the U.S. There was one night that I watched in the labor room in darkness while a woman with a condition called eclampsia was fighting for her life. She had high blood pressure, she developed seizures, and there was just none of the equipment and the facility to really keep her alive, and she was in utter darkness. It was just one of the many heartbreaking scenes that Laura encountered on her two-week visit. And I sat there watching and wondering, what am I doing here? Why am I actually here right now at this moment? And I thought maybe Maybe part of the reason that I'm here right now is because maybe I can be a voice for these women who are dying in silence. Now, this is the thing I'm wondering. If we have this and we just put it up a little bit, can you put this up higher? So the conversation hard. began of how to best help these women. It was Laura's husband, Hal, who came up with an answer. I'm a solar guy and I like to solve problems and this was a perfect problem for solar to solve. What Hal designed was a solar system that not only gave the hospital light, but power for their blood bank refrigerator. However, before that was completed, Laura wanted to show her colleagues what solar was all about. So inside a suitcase, she packed a small demonstration kit that Hal assembled. What was remarkable was that when they saw that, they wanted to keep it. And they said, please leave it here because this will help us save lives even right now. And that was the, the light bulb moment for us. Even a little bit of power could go a long way towards saving a life. It wasn't long before word spread about the solar kit. Clinics and hospitals around the world began asking for one of their own. We weren't thinking we were going to become a solar suitcase company. <laughs> this was like, this was just a little something in my spare time. That was the idea. But the need was just too great. There was an earthquake in Haiti. Doctors from the Bay Area were going to work in the tent clinics and they needed a reliable source of electricity. Meanwhile, Laura was hearing more about the tough conditions African midwives faced during childbirth. You lost the light, and the only way to get light was to burn the calendar, the, the wonder calendar. so you could see enough you to like cut to the cord. Day. Okay, you get the prize for the most amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the couple decided to start the nonprofit company, We Care Solar. If you had looked at my house in those days, you would have seen parts from one end of the living room to the dining room and spilling into the backyard. It was just covering everything because we were trying to keep up with this demand. That changed once the couple was awarded a grant from the MacArthur Foundation. Suddenly, the backyard project was on an assembly line. And so I said, okay, now that we're getting to this point, let's design it differently. The concern was that the solar suitcase could somehow fail when it's in a clinic half a world away. To compensate, Hal says he over-designed the system. So I just want to demonstrate this light to you. Turn it on. Very robust. It's designed to take many falls. It can be stepped on in the mud. And this light right here should last about 70,000 hours or about 10 to 20 years. With more suitcases being built, it was time to figure out how to get them to those faraway clinics. So far, Laura or a member of her small staff delivered each case personally. However, demand had now spread to 20 different countries, including Afghanistan, India, and Burma. That's when Laura decided to seek out solar ambassadors. We invited 14 women from around the world to come stay with us in Berkeley and to do a hands-on workshop that lasted for about six days. And we trained them, we set up all these troubleshooting problems, and then they're going to go out with us to the countries where we're installing solar electric systems and they're going to uh, train local people on how to do it, both how to use them and also how to install them. So far, the plan appears to be working. Now we have approximately 200 suitcases around the world and a conservative estimate is that we're serving 80,000 mothers and infants a year. What Laura has been able to achieve has not gone unnoticed. Among the many, she's received honors from the United Nations, the New York Times, and the Tech Awards. However, the biggest prize for Laura is the good news she hears from Africa. We had a doctor who requested a solar suitcase last Thanksgiving. He called us five weeks later and he said, I want to tell you what happened. The night that I came, I was able to save a woman with twins using the light. And I would have called you the next day, but there was an outbreak of cholera the next day. 
And for the next 30 days, every man, woman, and child that had cholera came to our clinic and we used the solar suitcase every night. He said, for the first time in the history of this village, no one died of cholera. We saved 122 patients. And he said, in the past, 50% of these people would have died. And so I looked at my husband after that, we were just both crying and said, oh my God, we have to keep going. I'm really proud of Laura. She is a force of nature. She makes things happen. The happiest day in my life. Tell me why. The life. Why is it making you so happy? Because she told that we are free from darkness. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> when you hear stories like that, and you realize that no matter how hard the struggle is, you're really making a difference in the world. Well, it's just about time to say goodbye. Thanks for joining us for this ride through Santa Cruz County. A special thanks to Sandy Leiden for all the history information and to the Iowa Pacific. For all of us at This Is Us, I'm Becca King-Reed saying so long. This is us.